Welcome to CarePod, a safe place to educate, inspire, and renew the caregiver. Listen in with our host, Dr. Kipley Bell, as she interviews different experts along the caregiving journey. Bringing back Felicia Phillips to the CarePod. So a few weeks ago, we had Felicia on just to talk about her Hanging with the Elderlies platform, her journey with both of her parents, uh, her father with Parkinsonian dementia, um, her mother with vascular dementia, Alzheimer's with additional comorbidities of diabetes and renal function impairment. Um, and she's a busy professional. So she is the client that um, I often bring to the table to consult with how we manage our busy professional lives while caregiving. Uh, Felicia is a licensed financial professional. So I brought her into our uh, live Facebook group, private Facebook group to discuss all things long-term care insurance, financial planning, and options for us at this age uh, so that we can make decisions at our 40s and 50s that maybe our parents didn't make uh, to avoid a compromised or stressful uh, aging chapter. So listen in. Woo, chow. Listen. <laughs> the caregiver journey. We're both caregivers and we're both here doing the thing living on purpose, recognizing the importance of getting our houses in order, period. So um, as per our recent podcast together, um, Felicia is an expert in the insurance space. She's a licensed financial professional. And so I wanted to bring her live here in the group to school us on all things insurance, the steps were to take, all the things. <laughs> so I have her presentation up, but I want her, again, for those of us that didn't get to uh, experience the care pod and, and our conversation at that time, for her to reintroduce herself and her caregiver journey and her purpose in the financial space. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I actually go into that into the presentation. I've, I've incorporated that into it. So if we want to do that, we can. Um, but I want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. I know this is probably the at least the second time that we attempted to have this conversation. And the last time, if you remember, I was at an appointment and it went over time and I called you and I'm like, I'm not going to be able to make it back home. <laughs> And as you talked about the caregiver journey, it just never ends. So right now, as we speak, you know, because we're Facebook friends, that my father has been in the hospital since Sunday. And so I am now juggling caregiving with my mother, who has dementia and vascular, vascular dementia and Alzheimer's and type 2 diabetes and epilepsy and hypertension and heart disease and probably something else I missed, right? Taking care of her at home and then working as a financial services professional, but then also keeping my ear to the ground, talking to doctors, nurses, et cetera, and going to the hospital with my father. So um, the past four days or so have just been a whirlwind, um, but I did not want to cancel this because, Kipley, this gives me purpose every day, and I hope that I can get through even talking about this stuff today without crying. Um, every day that I am moving forward in this journey, I'm like, God, if I have to go through all of this and all of this pain, let there be something that comes out of this. There has to be something, some reason that you have me experiencing this and you have me experiencing it right now. Yesterday, I got home from the hospital late. I was exhausted. I didn't see my phone, but I woke up to a message from yet another person, another friend who is now experiencing caregiving, having watched my story for the past seven years. And they're just like, this is hard. This is so hard. I can't stand seeing my loved one like this. I don't know how you do it. You are amazing. You're amazing. And so, you know, I encourage that person as I continue to encourage myself. I'll be very honest. This is probably the first time, and I'm saying this in a public space, this hospitalization in my father's current state is the first time that I've ever been concerned about, like, is this it? And so that, just navigating that alone um, over the past couple of days 
has just been super um, challenging, but there's a peace and a joy in knowing that whatever I'm experiencing right now, if I can share my experience coupled with my expertise in financial services at this point, then God has ordained me for such a time as this. And it is not for nothing if I'm able to help somebody else, encourage them, get the resources that I didn't have, be real, be authentic. Kipley, you know that I am. So, <laughs> um, so thank you for having me here. To those that are joining in, you know, you could be doing anything at one o'clock in the afternoon, at work, at home, doing whatever it is that you want to do. But um, my my hope is that for those caregivers that I can share information, resources, mixed in with a little bit of hope and joy and peace in the idea that there are some things that you can do. There's some things, listen, as a caregiver, I don't have the answers. Um, but there's some things that we can do and some things that we can plan for. And so this presentation that I'm going to be sharing with you, with you guys today, it's the first time that I'm sharing this presentation. And so um, I hope that I cover things on a larger, grander scale. Everybody's situation is different. And so um, sitting down with individuals one on one to talk about your specific situation, your specific needs is really what um, what will be the fruit of this conversation. But I hope at bare minimum, it gets you thinking. I hope that it gets you having difficult conversations, whether it is you thinking about long-term care for yourself in advance, which is wonderful if you're in that place and you're already thinking about it, or if there's still time for long-term care options for those that you might um, be caring for or that you know you may need to care for. So Kipley, thank you for this opportunity. And um, I don't know if, I guess I can operate or... <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, I'll I'll allow you to share. I think where we have that flexibility here with Zoom. So we'll do that while I'm doing that. I want you to kind of speak to two things for me, because this is the place that I've been mentally for the past few days in terms of I had someone say to me, you know what? Um, I had a client who didn't know how she didn't define herself as a caregiver, she honestly didn't know to term, to give a name to this experience. And, you know, in my, in my space, I'm here to say doctors, nurses, clinicians of all types, we're caregivers, you right. know, and we're also carrying the weight of whatever it may be in our particular circumstances. But for me, I'm trying to define what is the hard? What is the hard of caregiving? What would you say, what is hard for you? A lot, everything. <laughs> <laughs> everything is hard, but I think, so I'll tell you what, I, I text, I was very careful with who I reached out to with how I've been feeling over the past couple of days because I did not want to, to so I'll be very honest because we're in a group and not a larger Facebook. My father weighs 87 pounds. That's very scary to me. Um, and the minute that you begin to see the weight drop off, people will already have him in the ground. And so I was very careful with who I shared that with. But I have a friend whose father had the same thing. My father has Parkinson's disease and her father died about a year ago. And so I was trying to figure out who I could share, what I wanted to say. And I, I sent her a text and I said, I want to talk to you, but I don't. Because part of me wants some consolation and wants her to talk to me. But at the same time, I don't want to hear if she's going to say the things that I don't want to hear. And so I said, I want to talk to you, but I don't. Um, and something to that extent. And I just said, I'm, and I'm not ready to talk. So don't call me. <laughs> so it's just kind so of is it, is it, is it the fear? Is it the fear of, you know, having endured this journey for so long? And, and let me pause myself right there in full, full, full transparency, right? 10, my son turns 10, I'm at the birthday party, I'm fussing at my mother to get out the door so she's not late for her own grandson's party. I was really upset. Literally, we got there at 4.03 for a four o'clock start, like carrying the cake in the door, the whole thing, right? There is a parent there that my son grew up in preschool with, and she's never had her mother. Like her mother had predeceased her childbirth. She has three children. 
and she said to me, Kip, I get it, you know, because I, I am acknowledging in this space, what's hard for me is the anger that I'm out here educating, getting everyone well, making sure people understand the tiers of caregiving and getting our houses in order and wanting my own mother to be the one, to be the one that's driving and thriving and socializing and doing all the things. So that is the hard for me, walking this out personally while being professional, right? And she said to me, she said, I get the anger. She said, but I also would take that back. Like I would have, like for those who have lost, like they would grasp that in a minute. They would bottle that up in a minute to have their loved one back. So it's being sensitive to those people that have already lost, but also honoring your own emotion to say, listen, I'm not well in this at all walking through this. So that's my hard. You know, but I I definitely have been curious to inquire, you know, when people say it's just, it's all of it. It's the schlep, it's the incontinence, it's the, they don't know me today. It's the anger, it's the combativeness, it's the disrespect, it's the lack of time, you know, what's the hard? So definitely all of that. What, um, one, one of the things that my friend responded back to me with, I don't remember the whole thing, but she said, you've been in superwoman mode. And that stuck out to me. She said, and at some point, and I don't know if it's the, this is the point now, but you have to let go and let God be God. And I think that has been my heart the entire time. You know, I am mm. a person, Bible believing, saved minister of God. And so caregiving has really helped me to live by the scripture that says God's grace is sufficient. At mm. least and so I think oftentimes day to day and over the past seven plus years that we've been caregivers, it has been the battle of doing it in my own strength or doing it in God's strength. And she mm. was so, a superwoman. And so just by personality, I'm the person that when there is a problem, you figure out, you research, you Google, you ask, you read, you study, you do whatever you need to do to figure out what the problem is. And then you solve it. And caregiving for the first time in my life has put me in a place where I'm at, I don't have solutions. And so that just as far as a character, as far as who I am, is a problem. Um, You know, knowing that there's some things that I just can't, you know, that I can't change problem for me, right? My personality. And for the very first time, literally over the past two days, when you talk about the difference of, and I get it, and I'm not at all trying to be insensitive to people who have lost parents and loved ones. Um, but for those that have, particularly those who may have lost a loved one, but didn't necessarily go through the caregiving experience. So, you know, they, they had some kind of whatever, you know, sudden experience. Yeah. Um, to kind of the, the idea of, oh, but I wish that, you know, I could just talk to my mom one more time, or I wish I could do all of that. And again, this is not to be insensitive to, to those individuals, but when you're going through all the things that you talked about, when there's incontinence, when there is, you know, for me, my kitchen is right, my parents' bedroom and their bathroom is right off of my kitchen. So the days where my kitchen smells like urine while I'm trying to eat or prepare meals, When, you know, my father is falling down because he can't hold himself up, but he won't sit down. When my mother is leaving the house with three outfits on backwards and some of them dirty to hear if I could just talk to them one more time. It's just like, I'm not in a space. And a lot of caregivers are like, I can't do that. However, that being said, where I sit right now with my father, I'm sitting here and I'm like, I I get it. I Mm -hmm, get it. The last time I saw him walk was just a couple of days. Well, he's been in the hospital since Sunday. So sometime last week, I didn't even think he had the strength to walk. And I was on a client call. And right now where I am, my kitchen is to the left. And I'm talking to a client. And all I see is my father walking across the kitchen. And I'm like, oh, my God. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I just Mm -hmm. to grab him. And right after I got to him, he started to get weak and started to fall. Um, But so, yeah, at this moment, Watching him yesterday, laying in the bed and barely, well, I don't even know if he recognized me, but talking all kinds of mumbo jumbo that's not even his norm and um, just looking so frail, my thoughts did exactly that. Wow. 
if he could just get up and try to walk somewhere. Even that day, my husband was frustrated because my husband kept because my father kept on getting up and trying to walk. And my perspective, and he's like, he already fell. And I'm like, but babe, you don't understand. If he fell, then that means he's trying to move again. If he fell, he's getting up, he's trying to move, he's trying to walk. He wasn't doing that, you know, a week ago. So for me, yes, it's frustrating now because we actually had to strap him into the um, wheelchair. We have a gate belt that we sometimes use to hold him up because sometimes he just gets weak and just can't even sit up. So we also, it doubles as a let's strap him in when we don't need him running away. So we strap mm-hmm. him. But for me, that was a good problem to have because he mm-hmm. hadn't been working. So, um, so for me, I think that, I guess if I could summarize the hard, it is not trying to be everything and do everything. And even if I had to look at this, like if I had to do this all over again, which is another place where I differ from so many caregivers who say, but if I had to do it all over again, I would. Hip Lee. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> Mother, right. Hip Lee, I love my father, but I do not think that I would do this all over again in the same manner that I'm doing it now. So it's not that I would just leave them alone and just let them, but I would not do it the way that I'm doing it now because of a lot, because of the impact it's had on my children, because of the impact it's had on me mentally, because of the impact it's had on my marriage throughout my 23 years of marriage, including the past seven that we've been caregivers. So I would care give, and I think that we have to understand, and even as I talk to people, I want people to understand, do not feel bad about putting your parents in an in a safe facility, mm-hmm. facility, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Our culture, we don't typically believe in that. Prior to caregiving, I was judgmental. They don't care about their, when I was younger, right? They don't care about their family. <laughs> they in some place and all of that stuff, right? Ignorance, had no idea. So now, mm-hmm. although I took the, although I made the decision to bring my parents into my home and do what I'm doing, there is no shame for anybody doing it otherwise. And in fact, I encourage them to do it because the reality is at some point, those facilities possibly can care for your family member better than you can. And that example for me is right now, the only thing stand between my parents being in a facility and being at home with me is the finances. Because the place that I really do want them to go to, to be very honest, is anywhere from ten dollars to $12,000 a month for both of them. And so I literally have been working very hard to grow this business that I'm growing so that I can be able to do that because that's something that financially I can't do right now. But I can see just from doing that tour over the past two years of looking for facilities that I didn't even know existed, Kipley. Amazing places with swimming pools, movie theaters, barbershop, salon. Curated activities according to their their desires. Yes. And I think... Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's that's the purpose. That is really the why here is that what are the choices we can make, you and I, our cohorts that are 40-something, 50-something, even the millennials that have been raised by their grandparents that have a choice to purchase an insurance at a low price point to say, you know what? Kill the conversation about, I don't want to be a burden and all the things. Get a plan. Be prepared. What do you want to look like? You know, that's impactful caregiving. What are the choices we can make now so that our children aren't having this conversation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So let's get to it because, you know, we can we can go in. <laughs> all right. Do I have to you to let's, let's go. Yeah. All right, and guys, I didn't want to be super formal, but I I want to be able to do this more often, and so I wanted to capture some thoughts as I shared this with you guys today, and um, also wanted to make sure that, like Kipley said, we can talk about this. <laughs> we can talk about this for a while, and so um, I wanted to just have a little bit more of a format to talk through this, and so mm-hmm. give me one second as this comes up, and then we will rock and roll. I was trying to multitask and open up so I could see any comments and stuff, but I'm clearly not. Yeah, me multi- too. I don't know if <laughs> we are actually, let me see here. I'll try to look on my, um, in the group while we're here. Okay. Okay. So we're going right now. Um, I see a couple <laughs> people on. All right. I see Lois B. Tucker. Is that where we are? 
Yeah, I don't see Lois. Hi, Lois. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll monitor the comments as we go. Okay. Good stuff. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Super excited to be here. Kipley, you keep me on time as well. I will tell the truth and shame the devil. I did not time this out. And so something okay. you can talk about, and so I may not need to talk about it. But what I wanted to do today was to approach long-term care based on my personal story, which you, if you've been watching from the beginning, you've heard a little bit of that story. And then also professionally, as Kipley said, I am a licensed financial services professional. And so um, again, just so that you understand what that means, I am in business with my husband, Robert, and together we help individuals to save, grow, and protect money. We are licensed, well, actually I am licensed in life insurance and health insurance. And so this is just a listing of the many products and services that we offer to our clients, 401k and IRA rollovers, for those of you who are 59 and a half and looking to protect your life savings so that you don't lose it or risk it in the market. We offer life insurance options, um, long-term care, which is what we're going to be talking about today, college planning, cash value policies, fixed index annuities. We work with business owners on executive bonus plans. We do legacy planning, wills and trusts, debt management, and so much more. So if you are social media savvy, and you want to follow me, I am at FR Speaks on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or X. <laughs> I guess I have to update this, right? X, TikTok, as well as Threads. I'm most active with my parents on Facebook. It's not included here, but you can follow us at Hanging with the Elderlies. That's at Hanging with the Elderlies on Facebook, as well as on Instagram and YouTube. So that's just a little bit about me, who I am, and what I do, and we're going to get into it. So um, the key learning objectives for today would be to provide a working definition of long-term care and what it entails, to discuss the value of long-term care and why it's so critical, and to explore available options for long-term care. So what is long-term care? Well, this definition came from the National Institute of Aging, and it says that long-term care involves a variety of services designed to meet a person's health or personal care needs when they can no longer perform everyday activities on their own. Oftentimes, people think that long-term care services are automatically provided as part of like your health insurance or Medicare or Medicaid, and the reality is that it's not. And so there is a need to fill that gap. And this definition came from the National Institute on Aging. And so what types of long-term care are there? Well, there's home-based care, right? And home-based care is informal. It's often unpaid care and it's at home, right? It's help from family, help from friends, help from neighbors. And it may include things like bathing, dressing, eating, preparing medications, administering medications, running errands, helping with cleaning, things like that. And then it may be supplemented by formal care, which is paid, right? So at the beginning of our time together, Kipley talked about the professional caregivers, right? As well as um, individual caregivers. And so when we talk about caregivers, I will say that right now I'm talking more about the unpaid caregivers, the family, the friends, the neighbors, those individuals that have stepped into that role of a caregiver, not by profession, but by choice because of a particular loved one. And so um, that is the home-based care. Then we also have community and residential care. This is where you're getting care from like an adult daycare center. My grandmother um, years ago went to an adult daycare center when um, she lived with us at home as she was dealing with Alzheimer's. There's the senior center. My mother and my father have both attended senior centers. And depending on where you are, the senior centers are act actually a free resource. So my parents were able to attend a senior center Monday through Friday with transportation at no cost. That's in the state of Georgia. In the state of Pennsylvania, they were actually able to go to the senior center at no cost, but they did have to pay a nominal fee for transportation and food was included in that. So that is um, one form of community care. And then of course you have the residential facilities, assistant living and not nursing homes, but <laughs> nursing homes. And I will say this, um, you know, years ago when I thought of a facility, I thought of this old person sitting in the corner in a rocking chair or in a you know wheelchair or whatever and just not getting any care, not getting any attention, just kind of be, being left alone. So many um, assistant living facilities are really amazing right now. I just can't say that enough, whether it is a facility that provides different levels of care. So now there are places where they have independent living for people that may have moved out of their you know family home 
and they're moving into a community, but they're still independent. And then assistant living, memory care, et cetera. And many of those facilities are so amazing, right? They're not like the places that you're scared to leave your loved ones, um, but they can be really um, costly. And so those are the types of care. Now, my story. I could pretend that this is blank on purpose, but the reality is there was supposed to be a really cute picture of my mother and my father here, which you don't see. But um, just briefly, I did talk about them um, a little bit. And so I will give you a condensed version of that story. I am a caregiver for both of my parents. My mother is 74 years old. I've been a caregiver for them since about 2016, 2017. My mother, again, has vascular dementia, Alzheimer's, sleep apnea, epilepsy, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease, and stage 3 kidney disease. Now, when I became her caregiver, I knew she had diabetes, and that was it, Kipley. <laughs> she had diabetes, and it was through the caregiving journey when I started saying, okay, well, now I'm a caregiver. Let me start going to these appointments with them, that at each appointment, I found out she had a million other conditions and more medications to manage and more things to do and more hospital visits and such. And that came as a, as the fruit of me becoming her caregiver. And then you have my father, who's currently 76 years old right now. And um, my father has Parkinson's and he has Parkinson's related dementia. So all of that about my father. Felicia froze, um, I think while she's coming back. Interested in learning more about the Impactful Caregiving Affiliate Program? Reach out, connect at impactfulcaregiving.com. Um, Felicia, as you're getting settled, I have a question for you. You mentioned the rollovers at 59 and a half. So for those people that are in that cohort, do you, uh, is there a way to roll over a 401k into a long-term care plan? Or what if you have a 401k that's at another, uh, a pre previous employer? Is that possible? A great question. Um, a long-term, the long-term care options that we offer are insurance options. And so you cannot, unfortunately, roll over a 401k, 403b, or any of the traditional types of retirement plans into, um, into an insurance plan. And so okay. um, there are some options with those plans. When we roll over, we roll them over into what is called a, um, with my company, a fixed index annuity. And so that's another type of insurance plan where you're moving um, from one qualified plan to another qualified plan, or if it's, you know, cash money or something like that, then it's not, it's non-qualified, but you're moving it into that plan. So you're not able to move um, money directly into an insurance plan. You would have to uh, surrender that. And the reason I said 59 and a half, for those of you who are not aware of that, of like the, the numbers and the parameters around pulling money out of your retirement, there's a 10% penalty when you access your retirement plan before 59 and a half. So once people get to 59 and a half, they can decide that they're ready to pull their money out or they can roll it over into another plan without incurring any of those, um, any of those charges, the 10%. Now, depending on what type of plan you have, most of the plans you are going to have to pay taxes when you uh, surrender it, with the exception of the Roth IRA. So the Roth, you've already paid your taxes. And so when you um, access that money, it's going to be tax-free. But any of those other plans, you're going to have to pay taxes when you surrender it. And if you surrender prior to 59 and a half, then you are going to have to pay that penalty. But the benefit of the rollover, and this is a little different from the long-term care discussion, is that most of your traditional retirement plans are in the market. So you guys have seen the market. Maybe you're scared to look at your statements. You haven't. <laughs> but I assure you, if you look at it last year, if you can stomach it and really sit down and look at it, um, the market means that your money is at risk. And at 59 and a half, you don't have time for your money to be at risk. And so what I'm able to do is move your money into a plan that's going to remove it from all market risk. It's never going to lose another dime again. It can still grow at compounded uncapped interest rates. And um, you're able to turn that into a stream of income at a later date. In fact, I just um, 
had been working with my father. My father had an account outside of something for my current company. Um, and he lost in a year's time, he lost $65,000. That's way too much money to lose for somebody that's 76. And so um, when he got that account and started that, I was not in this field, didn't know anything about it. And um, once I, you know, started working in financial services and saw what was going on, I immediately started working to move my father's money. And so in fact, I think just a couple of days ago, he was approved maybe about a month or so ago, but it still takes some time to move that money into the new account. And so his, um, his new account is fully funded. His money is safe. It's protected. God forbid something does happen to him. My mother's the beneficiary, so she'll get that money, but he's never going to lose any more money at all. He was even able to get a bonus on that money, which is really great. And um, just to show like where the market is between the time that my father's plan was approved and the time that the money left the previous account to the new account, he lost $2,000, right? So when I say like keeping your money safe, he's now in a position where he's not going to lose any more money. Um, as far as long-term care, and I'll get to it as I move um, on. I didn't realize I was still on the first slide. I'll get to yeah. that. And I'm going to throw some questions at you too that are coming in on the chat so we can really try to get everybody's nuggets in. Um, Jay Cook, uh, Jay Cook Contracting, he wants to know, can your IRA be rolled into a trust without uh, it being penalized? So a trust is um, is a way to protect your money and to um, ensure that when you talk about wills and trusts, that your money is protected and that it is going where you decide that you want it to go. So I would recommend that you speak with an estate planning person for that, um, an estate planning attorney for that. And I, I saw you in the group when I was looking um, at my phone. I'm not looking at it right now, but I actually work with a network of attorneys that can really um, get into the nitty gritty of the estate planning with you. They will do a, um, a free consult and talk through what your specific needs are and then come up with a plan for you. And quickly, um, when you give us the very, you know, layman definition of the fixed annuity. So when you say that at 59 and a half, you could put monies into a fixed annuity, what does that mean in real time for someone who is approaching their aging chapter, but, you know, they're trying right. to get plans in place, but they still plan on working. Right. So um, you can actually put money into an annuity whenever you want. It depends on what the source is. The so 59 and a half is the number that um, is the age requirement for when you are able to move money or surrender or access your money penalty free. So fixed index annuity is essentially a contract that allows you to put money into a plan, allow it to sit in that plan for a period of time, sometimes seven, 10 or 15 years and continue to grow. And because it is an index plan, index means that it's going to mirror the market, but it's not going to allow you to experience the downside of the market. So when the market goes up, your money is going to go up and it's going to grow. But when the market goes down, like with a variable account, a 401k, 403b, your Roth IRA, your traditional IRA, the money in this account has a floor. So it's never going to go below that floor. And in our case, it means that you're never going to lose any money. So it is a great way. It's really designed to allow you to not outlive your money. So you can do a, um, an income annuity where you're putting money aside, um, you're putting a lump sum of money into this annuity, and then at your maturation date, again, 7, 10, or 15 years from, um, from that time frame, you're able to see that your money has grown, and you are able to then pull an income from it. Now, if it's an income guaranteed, it means that the company is going to look at your total amount that you put in, plus whatever the bonus was, and they're going to look at how long they expect you to live, and they're going to give you a specified number that they're going to contractually pay you out for the rest of your life. That's a guaranteed income annuity. Another type, and the one that I did for my father, is a growth annuity. And with that annuity, the money is just growing as quickly as possible, but we get to decide how much money to pull out, which means, I may, which means you can basically exhaust it. So with a guaranteed income, you're going to get paid out from that annuity literally for the rest of your life. Even when the amount of money that you put in has been exhausted, the company is still going to continue to pay you that guaranteed income from that annuity. With my father, because I'm in the industry, I said, I don't need somebody babysitting me 
We'll put the money in a growth in annuity. We'll let it grow and accumulate. And then we'll determine how much we want to pull out. Now, the risk of that is if I screw up, <laughs> right, I could pull out too much money and then my father will run out of money. But um, that's not our intention. And we sit down with our clients and we help them through that. So annuities, um, and I'll say this for anybody that's a little older, because sometimes annuities have a bad rep. The old annuities used to put money into this account. And yes, you could put, you could get income from it, right, for the rest of your life. But let's say that you put in typically $100,000 into this annuity. And in year three of finally getting your money back, you die. In the older days, that money went with the company, right? That was just it. So you put all of this money in there hoping that you're going to live long enough to get it back. Right. Those are the old annuities. And so sometimes I'm really careful with even using the term annuity, because depending on how you how old you are, your mind goes to that with the annuities that we offer now, there's a death benefit. And so that means that, you know, if you did put one hundred thousand dollars into this annuity and, you know, it grew to a million dollars. But at the point that you were ready to take income out, you passed away. Guess what? Your family, your beneficiaries will get that money. So um, it's now a win-win situation, whereas before it was kind of like gambling. I'm going to do it. If I stay alive long enough, I'll get to enjoy it. But if not, this company is going to get all of my money. So those are fixed index annuities. I typically can start those at $10,000, whether you're move, moving money from um, a 401k or whether you have money that's just saved up and you want to put it into an annuity. I can do illustrations to show you what that would look like based on the type of annuity that you are interested in and based on the goals that you're looking for. So they're all very, um, very different. Um, I can always get a bonus for you. So that's free money, which is great. And the best thing is that your money is protected. So the last thing that you want, if you, um, you, those of you who are on here now, remember 2008 when the market crashed, a lot of people were not able to retire because they had their money in the market and 2008 happened and overnight their money was gone. People were literally killing themselves. People were getting divorces. It was a horrible time, right? We want to protect you from that. So when you move your money into an annuity, it's protected from market loss. You're never going to lose any money. It's only going to grow. And um, it's really a beautiful thing. Now, I will say, unlike the insurance that is attached to the long-term care that I'm going to be talking about, um, annuities are taxable. So when you do pull that income from the annuity, with the exception of a rollover from a Roth IRA, all of the other vehicles, when you pull the money out, it is going to be taxed which is different from some of our um, insurance products where um, you pull money out of that account and it's actually tax-free. So it's a lot of information I know really hard yeah. to talk this into one session. Um, I will have my contact information available. Everything that I do is complimentary. When I sit down with you, I talk through what your goals are, what you're looking to do. I collect the information that I need and come up with plans and I can show you illustrations specific to your needs. So, um, I want to jump to the hybrid where you were, um, long-term me, care. I, yeah. I do have a question. Do you, um, for those of us, so you said the Roth IRA, you can roll over at 10000 to a, a, an annuity plan prior yeah, it, to 59 and a half or only at 59 so and a half? Here's the deal. You can't move money in service. So if you're currently, wherever your current employer is, most employers will not let you move your retirement plan into another plan prior to 59 and a half. That's considered in service. So you're locked in. However, if you have, um, those are employer-based plans, right? If you have an IRA, then certainly you can do what you want with that. Um, and if you are dealing with a retirement plan from like a previous company, so maybe your current company, you're contributing to your 401k, your 403b, your risk savings plan, or whatever that is, but you have a couple of old 401ks from your jobs over the past like 10 years or so. You can move those old 401ks, roll those over into a fixed index annuity. You just are restricted from typically moving something that's in service. Now, there are some companies that do allow you to do an in-service rollover, but those are few and far in between. Your best bet is to check with your HR department. They can let you know for sure. And then if you're able to roll it over, then you come and see me and we can look at some options. <laughs> Okay. All right. So let's, the biggest question I have is I have heard about these hybrid insurance policies. So basically you can pay into it as a life insurance and correct my ignorance because I'm learning too. You pay into it as a life insurance, but 
let's say you you come to the need of long term care prior to the need for life insurance per se. And so then those monies will help pay for your long term care. Is that accurate? Listen, I can just shut the presentation down and keep it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, long term care and like the need for long term care, I'm not going to go back to the things that, I, that I've already talked about, but essentially, I was my parents long term care plan because they didn't have one. And so the reason that I'm an advocate for teaching others about the possibilities of long term care is because this has been a taxing seven years. And um, there are some other options that are available that can help with that. And so that comes to okay, well, you know, how do I fund long term care? Well, one way is self tax, right? As I said, my parents right now, I would love for them to go into this amazing facility, but it's about $12,000 a year. So $12,000 a month, excuse me, $12,000 yeah. a year. I'm doing. Um, <laughs> it's about $12,000 a month for both of them, right? And so, um, and actually, because they're now in two different stages, it could even be more. Because at one point, literally last year, we were about to move them into a facility. It wasn't a $12,000 a month one. It's a different one. That was somewhat affordable, but at that very moment, my father had a change in his condition, which meant they were going to have to be separate, which meant separate rent for his space, separate rent for her space, plus the cost of care, and it blew up the cost that it was originally supposed to be. So self-pay self is oftentimes cost prohibitive. And then you have long-term care insurance, right? This is insurance that's specific for long-term care. The challenge with this is that this insurance is use it or lose it. So it is... You know, if you, like you said, if you put all your money, put all of this money into this long-term care plan, right? Maybe you're enjoying life and you're not, you're making sacrifices, not going on trips and vacations and buying yourself stuff so that you can do this long-term care thing. And you have all of this money in the in the insurance, um, but then you pass away or let's say you, you remain healthy and you don't need it. It's use it or lose it. It's sort of like our car insurance, right? We pay a lot of money in insurance and we hope that we don't have an accident. But that's really when the real value of the insurance comes in. Otherwise, it is simple protection, right? And so we hope that we don't need it. But if we do need it, it's there. And that's sort of what the long-term care insurance is. The other option is the hybrid insurance plan. And that's what um, many of the companies that I work with offer. And just so that you can understand that, because I don't think I clarified that at the beginning, I am an independent contractor. And so I work with over 100 A-rated financial services companies all across North America. And so that list of products and services that I talked about, I'm able to match my clients up with the companies that best need, meet their needs. So it's not me having to push one particular plan on you or one particular company on you if that doesn't meet your needs. We talk, we find out what works for you, what your needs are, and then I'm able to tap into that amazing resource, that amazing network of companies and pull out the best of the best for you. And so when I talk okay. about- Okay, sorry, I'm gonna I'm keep jumping in, sorry. So question here then, for the person that has the comorbidities, that has multiple conditions, does a hybrid policy become more expensive or limit them in their options uh, because they're at a later stage of life, midlife, 40s to 50s, 50s to 60s, roughly that- they are the diabetic. They do have the renal insufficiency. They do have all the things. Are there limits in terms of having access to these types of hybrid policies? Absolutely. So at the end of the day, it's insurance. And insurance goes through underwriting. And um, the younger you are and the healthier you are, the more cost effective it's going to be. So um, I probably have a little later on a slide toward the end that talks about the time is now, right? We, um, there's a quote that Kobe Bryant says, the biggest mistake we make is thinking that we have more time, right? The longer you wait, the more, the increase in the possibilities of you having some type of issue or concern. Like right now I'm 47, absolutely healthy. Just went to the doctor's amazed. All of my labs, everything came back great, right? So although my, I'm still 47, so I'm going to pay more in um, insurance premiums than my 25 year old daughter and my 19 year old daughter, but at least I don't have any of those other conditions. Now, that's not to say, guys, that if you have a condition that you can't get coverage, it really depends. And so, again, all of those are really um, individual scenarios where I sit down, find out what it is that you're dealing with. And there are some um, some conditions that um, that may make it much more difficult 
just like smoking, you know, even with just regular insurance. I had someone just yesterday, height and weight, they're perfect, right? Um, but they're smokers. They're, they're, the person's a smoker. He's 29 years old. We were looking for $500,000 in term life insurance. Term life insurance is the cheapest insurance possible at 30 years old for a male probably can get it for about $30 a month for $500,000 in coverage. That's amazing. But he told me that he smoked. And so when I went from healthy non-smoker to smoker, it went from somewhere around 30 something dollars to $117 a month. Right. Wow. Wow. Much higher risk because he smokes. And so that's going to mm. be the same with your, you know, your weight. Not to say that if you're overweight, you can't get coverage. But the more overweight you are, the more expensive that coverage is going to be. And at some point, unfortunately, I sit down with far too many clients that I can't offer anything to just because their weight is so um, much uh, beyond the guidelines. And so, again, the same thing with those di with those different conditions, again, does not mean if you have diabetes or hypertension or any of those things that you can't get the coverage. Um, everything has to go through underwriting. And then we have a host of different questionnaires that I may need you to complete just to give me more information about you. Because even the condition depends on how you're managing it, right? So you could have a diabetic like my mother who is not on any insulin. She's not on any diabetes medication. Her A1C is actually in a normal range. She's good on the diabetes side. Then we could have somebody else who um, has an A1C that's like 11, right? Who has uncontrolled diabetes, who... Um, is also on insulin, right? In fact, insulin, unfortunately, for at least one of the companies is an automatic denial. So it really depends on the company. And again, that's where me having access to that network works because if for some reason you are denied with one particular company, um, which most of the time I can know in advance what conditions are going to be a problem. Um, but if you're denied, I can always go to a different company. So the best answer or the best thing to do, guys, is to get coverage as soon as possible, while you're as young as possible and as healthy as possible, because you're never going to be any younger than you are today. So tell me um, on average, like, so your average Joe who, let's say they're hypertensive, they're not obese, uh, a non-smoker. Yeah, let's let's leave that. Let, like on average, what are the average costs you're seeing monthly on middle-aged folks uh, that are opting in for hybrid policies? So that is really, um, really hard to do because there's so many factors in that. So let me talk about what hybrid is. And okay. then I just yep. to help you understand um, why that's a difficult question to answer. So the hybrid approach is a long-term care rider option that is um, an add-on to a cash value life insurance policy. So cash value policies are policies that um, you pay a monthly premium. And, and that policy has a cash value that you can access and it has a death benefit, right? And so long-term care costs are paid out of that accelerated death benefit. So if I have a $2 million death benefit with this long-term care policy, then I'm able to pull out accelerated benefits from that death benefit in order to cover my long-term uh, my long -term care needs. And unlike the traditional long-term care insurance where it's user or lose it, in this case, when you take the hybrid approach with that cash value policy with the long-term right, excuse me, long-term care rider, your beneficiaries are going to get the proceeds from that when you pass away. And so, typically, the reason that that's a difficult question to um, answer, let me go back to the slide, is because there are a number of factors that go into putting that plan together. And so, I have to find out from you: Do you only want to use this for long-term care, or are you trying to leave? money for your children as well because and I'll give that's a great example right because any money that's pulled out of the um, plan for long-term care lowers the amount of the death benefit and so if you tell me well you know I want my kids to get something too then it may mean that we have to put in more money to allow for you to be able to pay out your long-term care needs if you have them and still have ample money available for your kids but you could have somebody else that says, I don't have any children or, you know, they're on their own. That doesn't matter. I'm more focused on my long-term care because I know my kids are not going to take care of me, right? And so that may mean that you can put in a different amount. Um, it depends on how much coverage you actually want or need. Um, it depends on your age. So it we have, uh, there's a whole list of things that I go through when I sit down with people to get really, um, to get folks that are tailored to meet their needs. 
Um, the lower end, the older that you are, the more money you're going to have to pay just in general, because the cost of insurance, again, is going to cost more as you're older and it's going to cost more if you have those health conditions. So the younger you are, the less health conditions that you have, um, the less it's going to cost. And then you have some flexibility with the amount of premium that you want to put in. Now, that part is flexible in that I'm not going to say, well, Kipley, you have to pay $700 a month. Or typically, you have to pay $500 a month. You might say, well, I only have $300. That's fine. But then that means that we have to play around. We have to crunch some numbers to see how much coverage I can get you at $300 a month, considering the cost of insurance and that long-term care rider. So it's a lot of playing yeah. around with numbers, budgets, and what your goals are. So, okay. So two questions on that. Like The reason for my ask is literally 23 years ago was when I made my mother retire. So single mom, divorced parent, raised me, you know, so all of her, everything went into me, right? So there was no education. And this is why I say that the millennials need to know this information because I was not educated on what needed to be done. All I knew was that my mom was kind of approaching her 70s at that point, maybe 65-ish roughly. And I'm like, I want my mama around for a long time. And this nursing is wearing her down in the hospital. So mommy rest, I've graduated, blah, blah. But at that time, long-term care insurance for her, I took out a policy and it was like five something a month. And I had to let it go then because I could not establish my own career footing, buy a house, do all the things that you do when you're 30 um, and sustain her. So right. fortunately, I have a life insurance for her. It's, you know, the long-term care is negligible option at this point for her. But it, you know, even at 49, I want to, I recognize the value, yes, of long-term care. But in the scheme of those that are, now I have my little guys that are sandwiched, da-da-da. Like, do you want to say I want to pocket five something a month. So that's kind of where I was going in terms of the ballpark figure. Also, um, when you say, so in hybrid, like, so let's say the law, the life insurance policy is a half a million. And then you're saying the rider for long-term care would be a separate figure on top of that, or that would be the half mil plus X amount. No, Explain that a little bit. Sure. So um, with a cash value policy, you would contribute um, whatever your premium is. Let's say it's $300 a month, right? And so that $300 a month is going to include, obviously, the cost of the insurance based on your age and your risk, um, your risk classification. And um, a portion of that money is going to go into your cash value. And then you have your death benefit. So using your example, you have a $500,000 death benefit. What that means is that, um, and I'm just completely making up these numbers. So I don't know if they align. Yeah, with yeah. Them, right. Um, but what it means is that if you um, hit one of the triggers for long-term care needs, which is severe cognitive impairment or inability to perform activity, activities of daily living, then you're able to pull money from that death benefit, that $500,000 death benefit, you're able to pull money from that. And it's typically, it depends on um, the plan. They're all very different as well. Um, but it can be anywhere from 1% to 4% of that um, death benefit on a monthly basis. So I, I think wow. like 500,000 would be maybe $5,000, right? I think in the presentation, I did a million. And so if you were looking at 1% of that, that would be $10,000 a month that you would be able to pull from that plan, which, you know, in my case, that would- That's cover, huge. Um, yeah, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Okay. For- I'm sorry to keep cutting you. We have a question. Is there a cutoff age for coverage? Yes. And I believe it may depend on the company. Um, and I actually meant to just clarify this before I got on. I believe it is 80. But um, whoever asked that question, I will confirm when we're done and I, I will come back and just update that in the group. And if you want to reach out to me separately, I will. Um, but remember that the older that we get, the more expensive. Imagine, yeah. 
Yes, if Kipley is saying how expensive it was. Now, I'm although I do want to clarify with you, Kipley, it sounds like you had long term care insurance as opposed to long term care insurance rider. So those are two different correct. things. Correct, correct, the- correct, correct. Like long- this fire was not existent to right. my knowledge. This yep. was not in place then. Right. So this is really something I'm going to have you use me. We can do another live where you can use me as an example, because it is something I want to do before I turn 50. Because once I turn the magic 5-0, the numbers will uh, increase per month. (laughs) Yep. So I believe it's 80, but um, to the person to ask that question, think about the potential health conditions that could arise at 80. So um, Mm -hmm. in my case, Mm -hmm. my parents, and also think about this, the majority of the claims, majority of long-term care claims are put in in people's 80s. So that does Mm -hmm. mean for us that are in our 40s, we're still in a pretty decent place to begin to put the money aside, right? Um, Because Mm -hmm. potentially we don't typically need it, wouldn't need it for another 30 years or so. But at the same Mm -hmm. time, everybody is not the same. You heard me just talk about my parents. My parents Mm -hmm. need it. And my mother is only 74. My father is only 76. So they are Mm -hmm. under the age of what you typically see as far as those um, long-term care um, claims. But um, mm-hmm. if they had a policy, they would have been eligible immediately because my father cannot perform activity, activities of daily living and um, they both have significant cognitive issues. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to let you flow uh, maybe another 15 minutes or so. And this is great. Um, so this is just telling you what your long term care, what your long term care writer is going to cover nursing home stays, assistant living, memory care, home, home health private nursing, et cetera. Um, And I think I just talked about this, right? What is the trigger for it? A chronic illness with the inability to perform at least two activities of daily living, um, you know, dressing, continence, eating, um, bathing, transferring, those are the activities of daily living. And if you're unable to perform those, then um, that's a trigger for you to to be able to do long-term care. Now, we'll just put this little quick plug in for those that are not in need of long-term care at this moment. We offer something called living benefits, which has a similar benefit. Um, It just may or may not be as um, robust depending on how much money you have in the plan. So living benefits also provides um, accelerated benefits for critical, chronic, and terminal illness. And I'll use my children as an example because I know their numbers. So my daughter is 25. And this also is a good example of the cost of insurance um, based on your age. So my daughter for $32 a month, which mommy pays because my children didn't get the value of insurance. They're still young. Um, For $32 a month, she has a $500,000 policy with living benefits. And so what that means, it is a term policy. So that's why it's so cheap. But for the next 30 years, she has $500,000 in coverage, which means if she dies, her beneficiaries are going to get $500,000 tax-free, probate-free. But also, if she has a terminal, critical, or chronic illness, right, with this policy, she's able to get an accelerated benefit. With a terminal illness, she can get up to 100%, so up to $500,000 from that plan. So this is not just insurance when I die. This is protection for me now. As a single person, she still lives at home, but, you know, she's single, doesn't have any children, not married, and so she has protection for her health. If she has a chronic illness where she's unable to perform activities of daily living for at least 90 days or more, she can get up to 24% of that policy. So from the $500,000 that she has, she can pull 120, um, I'm sorry, she can pull 24%. So she can pull 120,000 out of that policy. And then the critical illness rider, again, accelerated benefits means that if she has a heart attack, if she has a stroke, in-stage renal disease, diagnosed with cancer, she can get up to 95% of her benefit. So $450,000, if she said, mom, I just had a stroke, I'm like, okay, let's put in a claim and we can get a check for $450,000. And so that is a low cost option for younger people. It's not long-term care, but it does, um, it does facilitate some of the same issues. I'd like to say that it provides peace of mind for you so that you can heal and you don't have to worry about, is my car going to get repossessed or, you know, am I going to keep up with my mortgage or my kids still going to be able to, you know, go to school or what have you because you have this benefit in place. And because it is a time policy, it is um, much lower in cost than, um, than some of the other policies. So this, so 
this is, is this an option better than like the Gerber, for instance? So could we take this living benefit policy out for our children? So and can we, they pull that, can they pull that living benefit for college? Like when you spoke about the 120 that they can pull, can they, or for a car purchase or tell me, speak more to that. Sure. So. Cause you have, know, you got grandparents in here, so we gotta, we gotta cover all the bases. So that policy, so living benefits is something that's available with a term policy, but it's also available with a permanent policy. So I want to make that clear. The term policies are most cost effective. So that's why, like I said, my children, my 19 year olds, term policy is $24.08. My 30, my, my 25 year old hers is $32.08. Now I have a policy that's $100 a month, but I only have $350,000 in coverage. So I'm paying more than three times as much as my children are for less coverage than they have, right? So again, age factors in, but living benefits are available with the term policy and with a permanent policy. Um, so that's one thing. Regardless of the age, regardless of how young they are, or you can't do a term. Term policies are eighteen and older, so therefore, okay, okay, okay. okay. As policies for children, we do offer Gerber. I work with Gerber, and so I can put you in a Gerber plan, but I'm not um, <laughs> because we have a better plan. And in fact, it's mm -hmm. really funny because a client right now who is just approved for a plan called our Million Dollar Baby Program. And it does exactly what you asked me, um, Kipley. Can you take money out for X, Y, and Z? Before I talk about that, I want to be very clear. Term policies do not have a cash value. So although I said with living benefits, you can get those different dollar amounts based on those critical chronic or terminal illnesses, that's the only way that you get money out of that policy. It is not a cash value policy. It is a term policy and there's no cash value in the policy. Now, are there cash value policies that are available for um, children? Absolutely. Do they far outperform the Gerber program? Absolutely. And so um, with our million dollar baby program, again, it's still the same. It's essentially the children's version of the cash value policy for adults, right? It gives you a longer time to be able to grow money in the plan. Um, you do develop a cash pot, a cash value. You can pull that money out for college, to start a business, to flip a house, to pay for your, your trip, to buy a car. You can do whatever you want with that cash value, and you still have a death benefit. Let me give you a scenario that's pretty amazing. $500 a month from birth to age 23. Follow me. $500 a month to age birth to age 23. And you can start wherever you want. Um, but I'm giving you a scenario that's going to give you a really big, like, wow factor, right? $500 a month from birth to age 23. You don't contribute a single dime more after age 23. That plan will accrue enough money to be able to pay for college and also allow your child at age 65 to have roughly $2 million in cash value plus a death benefit and be able to pull in retirement income about $100,000 annually tax free. It is like the financial pocket knife. It does everything. And so right now, in fact, the reason that the client was looking at Gerber was um, because she thought she had to put in 300 or 500. And I said, no, I said, I showed you that because I wanted to show you what you could do in addition to paying for college. You don't have to do, you don't have to do $500. You can do a lower amount, but what it means is that it's not going to accrue as much money and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be able to, to your child is not going to be able to pull out $100,000 a year if you're just putting in $100 a month for 23 years, right? So those differences, but um, typically for college, you're looking at if you want to pay the full cost of college, which, you know, we're averaging about $100,000, then you're probably looking at paying somewhere between, um, somewhere around $300 a month if you're starting at birth. Again, just as I said, for retirement with us older people, the older we are, the more you're going to have to put in. And so if your child is already five or six, then you're going to have to put more money into that plan. But it grows at compounded interest. Again, you're able to pull the money out to use it for whatever you want to use it for. And, um, you know, I like to show people what's possible. And then we back into whatever their budget is. So I don't want I have some people who are young, who are single, who are putting a hundred or one hundred and fifty dollars into that plan. Right. It may or may not pay for all of college. It depends on where they go to school, but it will help. And then the other great thing about it is that it's flexible. 
So I tell my young people, you may start at $150, right? And as your income changes or as you make more money, have more cash flow, you have some flexibility in this plan to increase the amount that you're putting into the plan. So um, that is our million dollar baby program. It is absolutely amazing. Again, all of these factors depend on what your goals are. And so I can put together plans and we do all this for free. Sit down with you, get your information, put together some illustrations, crunch some numbers. You may say, you know what? I can do $100 more and I'll show you what that looks like. Or you can say, you know what? That's too steep. Let's take it down a couple hundred and I can show you what that looks like. And then it also depends on the amount of coverage. So the more benefits you have, a million dollars in coverage, means that in order to keep up with the cost of insurance and all of those things, you would have to contribute a little bit more than if you had like 250000 in coverage. So like for my daughter right now, she's 25. I'm trying to make sure she has at least a million by the time she is at traditional retirement age. And so she's just starting her plan with $300 a month. Now, I really want her to have $2 million, but she was whining about this 300 right now, living at home and not paying any <laughs> bills um, and working full time. So <laughs> we started at 300 and um, she will be able to increase what she's contributing to that plan over time so that she's set for um, retirement. And that's tax-free, right? So that 401k is losing money, that 403b is losing money, and you have to pay taxes. And there's that penalty with these cash value policies. There's no penalty when you withdraw money before 59 and a half. You can use it for whatever you want. You can borrow from it and choose to pay it back or not. I have a lot of people right now that want to roll over their 401k, but they're like, but I have an outstanding loan. So they're stuck, right? We're trying to pay back that loan and knowing that with the market going down, they're potentially losing money. In this plan, you can borrow from it and you can pay it back if you want or not. If you do not pay it back, it does come out of your um, death benefit when you pass away. Sort of like what happens with the um, long-term care, right? That's why this hybrid, that's kind of how this hybrid policy um, was birthed, Kipley, because it's kind of the same model. So you're able to pull money from the account based on what you have in your cash value, your death benefit, and then anything that is pulled out will come out of your uh, death benefit. And so the same and that's, thing with- that's clutch. That's clutch because for families that don't have it or families that may be left with an estate that's riddled with debt, or what have you, upon the person's passing, that it's satisfied out of that money. Or for the one that has done their due diligence is responsible to say, you know what, I don't want this to fall on Joe's shoulders, what right. have you. So that's right. really key. You, you have my, a question. Okay. Let me say this really quickly as far as paying off debt. The uh, proceeds from your life insurance policy are tax free and probate free. And so that goes to the beneficiary. They can choose to pay off the stuff, but that's their money. So they don't have to. That's the benefit of having a life insurance policy is that it is protected from creditors, from debtors, from the IRS. So they can't, you know, this person dies and they left you a half million dollars and they may have had other debt. Those debtors can't come and pull that money from that death benefit. But if you have an estate, if you have a house or you have other assets and stuff that you have not put into when we talk about estate planning, a will and a trust and all of those things then that's where um, that's where um, the debtors can come in and pull that money out of the estate. And then once all of that is satisfied, then whatever is left will go to your family because you didn't put those things in place in advance. Amazing. So I have a question. Can a rider policy be taken out on anyone? Like, do they have to be kin to you? So say you are a godfather or you are you know, it's your nephew. Well, not well, a non familial, non blood uh, relative or relationship, I should say. There does have to be insurable interest. So, typically, a relative um, or a business partner, I can't just say, Kipley, I want to take a policy out on you, right? But, um, you know, my son, my daughter, my grandchild, or a relative, or even a business partner, when we get into insurance coverage for business, you can do it for business partners. But there has to exist something that's called insurable interest, which just prevents you from just going out and randomly, you know, just picking up policies on random people. Amazing. Okay, so we're already... Uh, you know, 221, it's up to you if you want to roll another five, 10 minutes, and then they have the replay. And I mean, clearly, Felicia is fire with this knowledge. I think it's, it's important to 
have the consultation. I mean, she offers a free service to, to sit and talk shop on your specific needs. Um, but go ahead to kind of target, I know, the specific uh, talking points that you wanted to discuss. Okay. So we talked about what triggers it. Um, I think I'm almost done. This was talking about, you know, how much do I get paid, right? And so most companies are going to pay out between 1% and 4% of the death benefit or the HIPAA per diem. So that's $420 per day. It depends on um, how it's set up. Also, not in my presentation, but all companies do things differently. So there's some companies that um, will not pay for or will not reimburse for um, for informal care. So like for me, I, even though I live, breathe, and, and bleed my parents, some companies won't, um, they won't count that because I'm not a, a, an official like clinician or something. Other companies will. So it's important depending on what your needs are, when you're thinking about which company to go with to make sure that that's in place. Some companies will just, you put in the claim and they're going to pay it out. Other companies want you to grab all these receipts and keep track of stuff. For that, that wouldn't work for me. So <laughs> that was not going to work yeah. for me. There, there are different options and there are pros and cons. So you want to ask those questions as you're deciding on which one you want to go with. And again, in this example, if the death benefit is $1 million, um, then your monthly contribution for that, I'm sorry, your monthly distribution for that will be $10,000, which is amazing. And guys, I know that it may seem like, you know, even Kipley with your example, $500 a month to pay for, um, you know, to, to get insurance for your mother. But when you think about on average, the cheapest place that I found for my father, and that was with like an old sweet couple that I don't really think they were clinically, like they just, they, had, <laughs> they brought in yeah. contact. But they were trying to charge me $4,800 $4, for just my dad. And so, you know, when you look at those costs compared to, or like I said, the place where I was going to send both of my parents was $12,000 for both of them. And so long-term care is expensive. So getting the protection to, to prepare for it um, can be costly, but this hybrid approach really gives you a little bit of flexibility to do what might work for you. Um, yeah, I definitely think the hybrid is is fire. It really is. But I, I I use that $500 example because there are those of us, you know, starting out, you know, at 30 something, whatever that, you know what, it's not a priority. You right. know what I mean? The buying the house is the priority or the starting okay. my family is or whatever. So what what can that look like realistically? So right. yeah, and you're absolutely right. I lost all that money. Like I paid 500 a month for a minute until I just couldn't do it. And so I lost all of that. So being right. able to have a hybrid situation is, 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 you know, valuable. Absolutely. These are just some ending statistics. I just went to a training and wrote these down because I knew I was going to come and talk to you guys. So I'm um, 70% of people age 65 and older are going to need long-term care. You have to make the decision of when we talk about priorities, are you going to be their long-term care? Right. Or are your children going to be the long term care plan for you or are you going to um, invest in something for yourself now? In 2021, there were only seventy five thousand one hundred and sixty two long term care policies. That's pretty scary. But it makes sense because that's why there's so many stressed out, burned out caregivers doing what they do because people don't have these plans in place. And then finally, only 11 percent of the U.S. population has a long term care plan in place. Again, very, very, very scary. And so we yeah. want or that we're able to do something about that. Now is the time I shared this quote earlier, the biggest mistake we can make in life is thinking we have more time. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up with letting you guys know how you can schedule some time with me and I will put this in the group. Um, you have my phone number there. I will admit I'm horrible with checking messages only because, and I know I'm, I'm a business owner and stuff, but because my mother with Alzheimer's and vascular dementia fills my, my mailbox up constantly to the point that there are, there's no room for any other messages. It's all her. And I have to go in and constantly like delete all of her messages. So I will say text is probably better for me um, to reach me by phone, but you have my email address. And then there's a link there where you can schedule your complimentary consultation. We will discuss all of your specifics and explore available options and then see if we can get you qualified. Yeah, absolutely. Wait, go back to that slide. Go back to that slide. Okay, so for our CarePod audience, I'm going to flip this over to, uh, we are on YouTube now, CarePod's on YouTube. So uh, definitely check uh, Felicia Phillips out. It's info at Felicia R. Phillips. 
P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S dot com and, uh, you know, connect with her. I think that it's important for us to gain the knowledge we need to apply it to our individual circumstances. So I'm really thankful that you joined us live here today. And I know that you provided a lot of benefit to many people. And I'm all about the authenticity, like we are doing it. We are actively caregiving our parents <laughs> while professionally walking our own careers out. And I think that that is an important distinction um, to bring to the table at someone who's living with uh, two parents. She's double whammy right now, okay? Parkinson's, renal failure, diabetic, you know, Alzheimer's, vascular dementia, all of the various challenges, uh, you know, and a daughter that's honoring her parents through it all. Uh, so I really appreciate your time, Felicia, very much so. And I'm sure the group uh, does too. Um, so go ahead, babe, go ahead. No, that, I don't have anything. I was just saying thank you. Thank you, Kipley, for allowing me to share. And thank you to everybody that took time to watch. Those of you that are watching the replay, absolutely appreciate it. And if there's anything that I didn't talk about, that um, that you are interested in, Kipley, or even anybody that's watching, or anything that you think would have been valuable specifically for this long-term care conversation, absolutely let me know, because this was the first time that I did this presentation in this format. Um, any specifics for your own family and situation, we can talk through with your one-on-one um, -on -one complimentary session. So I look forward to serving you. And as always, it's a pleasure to um, to work with you, to share information, and to just you know talk about our journeys together, Kipley. So thank you for all that you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, too. Great information right from the source. For more information on how to care give like a boss, check out impactfulcaregiving.com. Want to be a guest on the show? Contact us at carepod at impactfulcaregiving.com.